Okay. So welcome everybody to the seminar. Um, this is a seminar sponsored by the International Society uh, for Quality of Life Studies. Um, and uh, today's topic is uh, walls of glass and uh, measuring deprivation in social participation, which is um, one of my more or less recent uh, projects. And I'm happy to share this uh, with you in this context and I'm interested in any kind of feedback, comments, questions, suggestions. Um, so this topic, uh, may maybe uh, quickly to introduce myself, I'm currently a um, postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Demographic Studies in Barcelona. And I'm also research associate with the Oxford and Poverty Human Development Initiative, uh, for short OFI. And my research interests um, are essentially everything, well, say applied welfare economics, so themes around the topic of human well-being. But my expertise is more in the measurement and analysis of multidimensional poverty. But I'm also interested in other topics around that theme. So let's uh, come to, to this uh, to today's talk. Um, so in a nutshell, what I'm going to do or what I'm presenting in this pres uh, in this uh, paper is uh, I'm proposing indicators for measuring deprivation in social participation, as the title indicates, or actually it's more precisely how to arrive at such indicators, because there is no such there is no unique way to to come up with uh, uh, such indicators, and this this presentation or the paper uh, covers actually both. So we start with conceptual considerations: uh, what do we actually want to measure? And uh, this, this conceptual considerations are informed by the capability approach. And we will also cover uh, uh, operationalization using, using actual data and uh, empirical analysis. And the results that we obtain in, the, in, in that empirical analysis will later be linked back in the discussion, uh, will be linked back to the conceptual considerations to actually assess the performance, uh, uh, how plausible is such a, such, such a measurement approach. And if you're interested, there are two working paper versions circulating. Uh, circulating. One is an OFI working paper and one is a SERP working paper. So you, I will, some things I cannot uh, cover in detail, but you can find uh, the full argumentation there. So let me start quickly with some background. Um, certainly, uh, the topic of social connections is, uh, it, it's pretty much undis undisputed that social connections or social participation is in one form or another part of human well-being. Um, that's pretty much undisputed. And for example, in the Stieglitz Commission, but also the OECD Better Life Index, it's, it's covered in different, in different platforms. Uh, but in, in the literature, there are a couple of obscurities of difficulties linked to the particular lines of research, such as social exclusion uh, or social capital or poverty. So all of them somehow refer in one way to another or another to, to the concept of social participation. But there are difficulties on the conceptual side in the literature. I think this becomes particularly obvious if you read, for example, the Stieglitz report that was published uh, approximately now 10 years ago or even more. And um, their social connections are actually used as an umbrella term. So they subsume all kinds of very different conceptual different things under social connections, including social uh, activities like meeting friends, but also trust and reciprocity, which are actually established measures in the literature of social capital. Similar social support, but also social networks. The number of close friends is covered there and workplace engagement, among other things. Um, so besides these conceptual difficulties, what do we actually mean by social connections? There are also many empirical uh, difficulties that we, that, we, that we see or face when we want to do such, a, such, an, such an analysis. And uh, one problem here is that the concept or the, uh, the, the abstract, uh, the social participation in principle is an abstract activity. And it can look very different in specific societies uh, across time and across place. So we have diversity in concrete activities, going to the cinema, meeting on the marketplace and so on. I mean, it's like easy to, to create long lists here. And then it's also a relational activity, which always relates to the particular society in question. So it's not independent of that. So that's another, another difficulty. And the importance of resources like income, for example, they actually vary too. And that has been stressed uh, by Amartya Zen in his uh, 1983 paper, Poor Relatively Speaking. It's, it's a prominent topic there. 
And the third empirical dif uh, uh, difficulty, actually, no, it's not an empirical, it's more uh, a methodological, is um, that it's not straightforward. How do we aggregate across activities? That's not a trivial exercise. And that, again, has been emphasized in the literate, in the report of the Stiglitz Commission. So in, in summary, we have conceptual difficulties. We have empirical diversity and methodological issues when it comes to the analysis of social connections. What is this paper going to do? What is the ambition of this paper? So first, the idea is uh, it offers a conceptualization and operationalization of deprivation social participation. So what do we want to measure and why do we want to do it this way? And in addition to that, an empirical illustration. Uh, conceptually, I built on the capability approach and um, I'm trying to illustrate that there are two ways in how this helps us in our measurement exercise. One is it sharpens the contrast to related concepts. And second, it also guides the operationalization of the measurement. So it helps us actually to, uh, to make some of the decisions we are confronted with. Um, the key idea is actually very simple. Um, the, the idea is to use information on commonly, social, uh, commonly performed social activities. And here we need to know how often some of these common uh, social activities are actually performed. Usually responses to this kind of questions are collected or recorded on ordinal case I count data or response scales. And once we have this information, we can, that's the principal idea, assign deprivation in, that, in this dimension of human well-being if an individual practices, not at all, this refers to every particular activity, and second, in any of these activities. So this can be interpreted as a kind of intersection approach, or more general, one can apply the LKF Foster approach to multidimensional poverty measurement as well. Um, and this has many benefits because we know how such a measure would respond and what proper properties are fulfilled. Um, so should we care at all about such a measure? Does it make any difference? Well, the results suggest they do. Um, on the one hand, uh, we observe, for example, that the deprivation and social participation measure identifies different people as poor or deprived uh, compared with alternative measures, such as a material deprivation index or as a monetary in, uh, income uh, poverty measures. Uh, it also correlates as expected with uh, several determinants. So I'm not offering causal evidence here that's beyond the reach of a single paper. So I'm just talking about conditional correlations, um, but it's correlating as expected. And it's, quite, it's also quite important to recognize that um, this is an important exercise in the empirical, on the empirical side it's also associated with a loss in life satisfaction. And that's, it's not essential, but it's supporting the notion that what we are identifying with deprivation social participation as suggested by this measure is something that people hurt, they suffer from that. It's not an, it's not an essential criterion, but it's an important uh, piece of evidence. So, and uh, based on this, the paper concludes that a valid measure is feasible. It might serve as a so social indicator and, uh, I, uh, and it's essential, such a measure is essential for both. First, the documentation of deprivation social participation. So to show that there is uh, a problem that requires uh, attention by policymakers. And second, also for the actual analysis to better understand the me mechanisms and drivers behind that. This work is related to a set of uh, previous, uh, a set of uh, different lines of previous research. I won't cover them in detail. I just mentioned them. So on the one end, of course, we have the research on poverty and social exclusion. We also have a few papers that explore factors behind social participation that goes beyond deprivation and social participation. It, they cover the entire domain. There is also the research on social networks and social capital, which is huge in themselves. And we have, as briefly mentioned, the research on life satisfaction. Single activities have been studied, uh, but uh, uh, more elaborated uh, deprivation measures like the one proposed in this paper have not been studied yet. Uh, and there is also obviously a connection to the literature, axiom to the axiomatic literature on po poverty and deprivation measurement. So now let me start with the conceptual considerations. So the capability approach um, is probably familiar to, to most of you, but still. Um, so human well-being, among other things, is uh, one key, key starting point for the capability approach is to consider human well-being to be multidimensional and that constitutively. 
And the idea is here that resources are converted into functionings. So we have many different dimensions, which we usually call functionings here. So the doings and beings we have reason to value, for example, being well nourished, being well sheltered. And uh, one of them could also be participating in social life. So, and uh, there is one formalization by Mathias Zen, which can be found in his Commodities and Capabilities from 85. And it looks approximately by, like equation one. The, motive, or the, the intuition here is we have uh, 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 we have on the on the on the left hand side uh, the functioning vector, different functioning outcomes, and uh, the x represent the resources. Resources provide characteristics. For example, in the case of uh, food, we have the correct characteristics of nutrients and uh, calories, and these cal uh, these characteristics are then converted using the conversion factors z, for example. I for individual level, S for social level, and E for environmental level. And to which extent people can convert resources into functioning achievements or achievements in the different dimensions of human well being, this depends on those conversion factors. Uh, and one such functioning could be or is frequently enumerated participation in social life. So we could write it like in equation two. I, I, dro I dropped the characteristics functions for. Uh, for convenience, uh, but the principal idea is the same, except that we now explicitly introduce an A, I, which is a vector of activities the individual can choose. Um, and some, some aspects uh, or some, kind of, so some features of this uh, activities, well, first, they are obviously time consuming, so we have to decide on which activities we're going to perform, and so they have to sum up to one, there is some constraint. Um, some of the activities might be social, others not. In principle, we can conceive both A and X as choice variables. And the idea is more spending more activities, more time on activities and uh, having more resources uh, at your disposal by tendency is increasing social participation, ceteris paribus. So technically speaking, uh, uh, the, the, the function is, uh, or social participation is non-decreasing in both arguments. So one interesting observation here is that how do we think about these different activities? In principle, we consider them as substitutes for achieving social participation. So that means uh, I, I can choose different, I have different means at my hand, different activities, and each of them may increase my social participation activity uh, or level of social participation. So that's uh, a useful insight. How can we now define deprivation in social participation? Well, the usual approach would be functionings uh, is, the, is the space where we would assign uh, a normative shortfall to be problematic. This is the space to talk about and to argue in a public debate or in a social choice exercise. And uh, simply formally or, or simply uh, speaking, the idea is that whenever we observe an individual to have a social participation, level that is below a critical threshold, SP uh, underscore or underlined SP, then we would consider to be the individual to be deprived. Now, the question is, where do we, how do we get this SP, uh, this underlined? Well, that's a normative decision, similar to other uh, decisions on what it constitutes a deprivation or what constitutes poverty. So there is uh, a role for public debate and social choice exercises, including a public debate here. So before we go to the details of how we proceed, let me quickly highlight why the capability approach can add something useful here. So on the one hand, we have already this contrast between the concrete social activities and the functioning of social participation. And that allows us to highlight a few things to sort, which are sometimes, um, I think, a bit mixed up in the, in the imperator work or in previous work. So on the one hand, we have diversity in means, the sp specific activities. They can vary across countries. They can, they can vary actually even within countries and over time, but they all contribute to the same end, to the identical end, namely the participation in social life. Obviously, that was different in the Middle Ages uh, compared to now. That there were different activities. It was not about going to the cinema or maybe going to the pubs was already there, but this depends. But the idea is, we have the, 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 typical, uh, the typical contrast between means and end, which is a key, in, key um, feature of the capability approach. We also expose this way, we expose the relational nature because of social participation, because it refers to a specific to society. And where does it enter? Well, in the choice of the common social activities that are performed in that particular society. 
Um, and third, it also helps actually to understand the varying role of income, something that Zen stressed in the poor relatively speaking paper. And what does that mean? Well, it depends on the way the society is organized with respect to social participation. So imagine if, it, if it's, you, if it's the, the most common activity is to meet in the pub and you need, uh, you have to buy a drink if you enter the pub and you lack money, you cannot actually participate in social life. If on the other hand, the society is organized in such a way that everybody can meet for free on the marketplace, social participation would be, uh, wouldn't require uh, this amount of resource. Obviously, it's a simplification for the sake of your argument, but I, I guess you can see the point. Another interesting aspect is the intrinsic relevance because um, from a capability perspective, social participation matters by itself. This doesn't include, of course, instrumental relevance. This way may, may go well hand in hand. And whilst, while we participate in social life, we may learn about future job opportunities, which could improve matching on the labor market. And this is of instrumental relevance, so to say. Another in, uh, related aspect is that if social participation or deprivation social participation is of intrinsic relevance, there is no need for further justification. Why am I mentioning this? Well, because actually uh, it turns out that um, previous research, um, previous research uh, actually combined things. So they combined low social, low social, sorry, uh, low levels of social participation with low income and only that was considered to be important. And the same is true for life satisfaction. So then, oops, sorry, that was the wrong click. Um, uh, here we go again. Sorry. Um, that was a click on the reference. Um, so, and a third, and a third nice feature is if functionings are studying uh, or measuring outcome variables, the benefit is here that we actually focus on realized achievements. So, the advantage is if we really measure the outcome of interest, we can study the different and diverse mechanisms that actually call cause the shortfalls. So, this is not part of the measurement exercise; it's a subsequent step for the analysis. And there is something in this direction. It's focusing again, not on deprivation in social participation, but rather on, um, on social participation in general. So over the entire domain, including for example, uh, with respect to low income, there is empirical evidence. One could e easily think of conceptual work uh, related to disabilities. And also in some of my previous research, um, I'm providing some evidence how the stigmatization related to unemployment may result in lower social participation. So, but the idea is if we have this outcome, if we focus on the realized achievements, we can, we, we don't have a measure that is bound to one particular mechanism. So next step, how do we proceed with the aggregation? It's important to see here, aggregation first across activities. I'm not yet talking about the aggregation step, which is common in uh, poverty measurement. Um, so there is, so the question here is how many deprivation indicators do we actually want to study? And uh, there is, uh, well, for better or worse, there is no categorical answer to this because it depends as usual on the objective or the research question that we have in mind. Uh, so you could easily argue for a, for a single indicator uh, approach, but uh, in this paper, I will show you a dual indicator approach, which offers more nuanced insights. So how exactly should we aggregate now? Uh, how does that work? So the idea is, or the key motive, or the key idea of the approach is, we want to ensure for our deprivation measure that social participation is not achieved through any other common social activity. So how do we write up and how do we implement that? Well, we observe social activities for each individual in terms of ordered uh, or case I count variables. So in the, in the first step, we have to talk about, uh, think about these activities and introduce a critical amount of time, which, we, which defines the threshold for when an activity is performed or when it is considered to be not to be performed. A candidate here would be, for example, uh, an activity is, uh, is uh, observed to perform in an, no, sorry, an individual is observed to perform in an activity whenever he or she reports a higher level than never. This would be one way. And we could apply this, uh, this approach to the different activities. So whenever we observe, and this is shown in equation four, whenever we observe an individual for each activity J to, re to report an activity level higher than the critical one, A uh, underscore, then 
this adds one to the uh, activity count. This is very much similar to the deprivation count in multidimensional poverty measurement. Um, but actually, it's not needed. Um, but that's uh, a side effect. Um, so then uh, this is the activity count. And now I'm, I was saying, okay, we apply an intersection approach. What would that mean? Well, we could say we, uh, we consider the, a person or an individual deprived in social participation whenever he or she is observed not to participate in any of the activities. So the activity count is zero. And that we consider to be a deprivation in social participation. Now, if the, if the approach would definitely be this kind of intersection approach, we actually could get rid of the summation. Um, but I, I like uh, to include it because it shows the similarity to the Alkaya Foster framework. And that has the advantage also to highlight that we have two sorts of normative decisions involved. One is what is the level of activity that we when we consider to be an activity performed? And two is uh, what is the amount in terms of the activity count? What do we consider to be relevant for social participation? So, and it's important that, the, that from the academic or research side, these decisions are flagged and highlighted and not uh, buried behind technical apparatus. Um, well, and of, I mean, this gives you many decisions. Um, in terms of the specification of the measure. I won't discuss in detail how this concept relates to others. I just mentioned the concepts. Who is in, if you're interested, you can find more on this in the papers. One is obviously how social participation relates to social networks. One is how it relates to affiliation, which is another functioning as suggested by Martha Nussbaum, another capability scholar. Um, it, also, it also relates to social support, which can again be distingu distinguished, emotional and practical social support. Social isolation is a kind of a broader concept. And if you are thinking in terms of multidimensional poverty, one could imagine, for example, to have affiliation and social participation as separate indicators and together they constitute social, so yeah, so affiliation and social participation together constitute social isolation. Could be one way to handle this. This is suggesting, this is not definitive, uh, definite. So the idea is here, this builds on, uh, has to build on future research. Um, and there is also the social uh, capital literature, of course, uh, the, 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 the concept of social capital. So how does the operationalization look like? Um, so I'm using here um, the German socioeconomic panel. Um, I'm using selected waves uh, for which the items have been collected. Um, and it's an unbalanced panel. Uh, I'm using survey items on social activities, which are well established. So they are not only common in, to, in, in, the, in the socioeconomic panel, but elsewhere too. So it's uh, established survey items. Um, the problem is not all of these are activities are clearly social and not all of these activities are asked on a regular basis. So there are some limitations to keep in mind. I will come back to this. Um, but it's something certainly one could fix if one wanted to construct such indicators on a regular basis. And the responses are usually co uh, collected on a four point scale. And uh, these are labeled usually something like, uh, imagine for example, you're asked to go to, to the movies, to the theater. And how often do you do this? At least once a week, at least once a month, less often or never. Now, one question is to what extent do these survey items cover the actual social activities of the respondents? That's of course a good question and complementary studies would be useful. But what I can say from this data is that for example, in 2011, around 68% uh, of the respondents re reported at least one weekly activity and 88% approximately reported at least one weekly and one monthly activity which is already um, substantial. So how do these questions look like? Well, you have here the examples. Um, they are translated from the, they are from the English questionnaires. Um, um, so for example, going to the cultural events, such as concerts, theaters, and lectures, going to the movies, such as pop uh, music, concert, dancing, disco, sports event. Now, and uh, this is, each of them becomes one variable. Then there is also doing sports yourself. And that's one of the issue, the variable sports is an issue in the sense that it's not clear whether somebody's going running or playing soccer in a club. Well, because it's Germany, probably many things will take place in a club, but we cannot observe from the data and complementary research would need to show. And the same applies kind of to uh, artistic and musical activities, which can be painting somewhere by yourself in the, in the countryside, but it can also be in a group. 
So there are good reasons given these activities that this might be in a social context, but we don't really know. So the idea is uh, I will study both of them and take care of that. And then there are other activities like meeting with your friends, relatives and neighbors and helping out friends uh, or your neighbors, uh, voluntary activities and involvement in uh, or civil engagement and, and attending religious events. Here you see a brief overview of, uh, on, the, on the responses. The only message to take from this slide is that, that the, you have very different distributions to take into account, but essentially we treat them accordingly. So we, we refer to the categories anyway. Um, so how do we construct the indicators? Well, I mentioned I will uh, apply a dual indicator approach and the uh, motivation here is to, to, to show more or to offer more nuanced views on the deprivation and social participation. And the first indicator is meant to capture more intimate and private forms of social participation. So what I'm having in mind is to address particular, to capture particular faithful or sincere relationships with rather high mutual ex expectations. And this, this, this measure uh, builds on the variable socialize and helping. And the idea is this deprivation indicator equals one if both activities are performed uh, at most less or uh, less often. The other indicator is um, uh, meant to capture more than non-participation in the wider public. And th this, what one could have in mind here is that this takes place with rather casual acquaintances, customary, uh, customary social activities of a society. They may result in a shared experience, but often they may uh, remain interpersonal shallow and non-binding. Uh, and this indicator draws on the remaining activities, all of them, except arts and sports, for which it's not clear whether that's entirely a social activity. And this indicator is equal, equals one uh, if all of the activities are never performed. So that's a stricter version. And the, the modification is the same indicator, but it includes the sport and the art uh, variable. And one sentence again, why this nuanced approach? I mean, imagine, for example, the situation of... Uh, neighborhoods sometimes called ghettos or banlieues, people living there might be well excluded from what you call participation in the wider, wider public. But they, on the other hand, they may well enjoy support of their peers and socialize freak on a regular basis. If you want to reflect such a phenomenon, you would probably need two indicators for that. I also study alternative deprivation measures, in particular an income poverty measure and a material deprivation index. Uh, I don't explain them in detail, but it follows broadly the German poverty measure. So it's, a, it's a relative to 60% of the median income and the material deprivation cutoff uh, also uses the Alkaya Foster method and builds on uh, items that are commonly used to measure material deprivation. So, this, so we need another step for aggregation to end up with a measure for the entire society and implicitly, or I was choosing here, the headcount ratio as a simple version. And you see approximately on the left, uh, you see like in what order of magnitude these measures lie. And we see around 10% for, uh, for um, uh, so, sorry, 5% for uh, 5 to 10% for the deprivation and social participation measures. And you see the next, the three next colors, uh, the, these gray, uh, the, the middle uh, three um, are the income poverty measure but they are for different thresholds, which is not surprising that the headcount declines if we apply a stricter cutoff. And the same is true for the material deprivation measures. Uh, it also declines with a stricter cutoff. Um, what you have to, yeah, you have to keep in mind uh, here. I mean, these numbers are important just to have a sense of magnitude when we study them more closely. So that's uh, in line with intuition. So how does the actual empirical performance look like? So here we see the social, uh, we see social demographic variables by deprivation status. And we see, for example, for DSP1, which is measuring the intimate, more intimate form of uh, social participation. We see, for example, that among those who are not deprived in that indicator, 6% are unemployed, uh, but 9% are unemployed among those who are deprived there. And this contrast actually becomes uh, more pronounced for the other two deprivation indicators. So here it's 5% versus 13%, and here 5% even uh, versus 14% uh, for the um, second version, uh, for the B version of the um, DSP2 indicator. And the similar pattern also emerges for, for income. 
So this is uh, as expected. Now the question is, do these measures identify the same people as deprived or poor respectively? So one way to look at this is to study their overlap in terms of who they identify as deprived. And here we see the performance of the deprivation social participation methods with respect to income poverty. And we see here, for example, there is what is highlighted. This means uh, we, ha we have the analysis for different poverty cutoffs. So, and I'm starting with a, with a 60% here and the DSP1 indicator. And the first number means 82% approximately are not deprived in any of the two measures. 12% are deprived only in income and about 4% are deprived only in social participation and only 1.3% are deprived in both. This is relatively little and a large chunk of those people who, is, who they identify as deprived or poor is unique to a particular measure. And one question here is, does that actually change or does this depend on the, on the poverty cutoffs that we choose? And for that reason, it's useful to look into the, to the line that is highlighted below because that shows us the proportion of the people deprived according to both measures uh, relative to the income poor. So this means uh, that 9% of those who are income poor are also deprived in social participation. That is not a lot. And this share is pretty much constant over the cutoffs, of, over different cutoffs. So this seems we identify different people as poor. And the similar pattern emerges also for the other indicators, but I won't discuss this in detail. So for the other deprivation indicators. Um, and the same exercise can also be performed for the material deprivation indicators, which I also won't discuss in detail. But the broad observation here is again, that we identify different people uh, as deprived or poor. And this does not vary uh, substantially with the poverty cutoffs of the um, poverty and deprivation measures, material deprivation measures. Now, one question is, if we compare these two indicators with each other, does that make a particular difference in, in who we identify? And this information is provided on this slide in the last row. We see that 90% are not deprived in any of the indicators. 3% are deprived only in the DSP1 indicator. 6% are only deprived in the DSP2 indicator and only 2% are deprived in both. So again, the overlap between the measures, among the measures is moderate. So this is just a summary of the, what I've just explained to you. And then the question is, what do we learn in terms of regression analysis? Uh, do, the, do the potential determinants per correlate as expected? I, I run this exercise for each of the social activities separately, but more interesting is the result on this slide, where we see uh, the performance for the indicators itself, for the, three, uh, the two versions of the DSP2 and for the DSP1 indicator. Again, I won't discuss in detail, but I would like to highlight that, for example, income in, in all three cases reduces X as expected significantly, reduces uh, the, the uh, more income, reduces uh, the probability to, re be, to report deprivation in any of the social participation, deprivation social participation indicators. Now, this is a different kind of uh, analysis uh, now with respect to life satisfaction. Here, the deprivation social participation indicators enter on the explanatory side. And um, uh, here we see that we have here the two indicators. The first model shows linear, all models show linear fixed effects estimations. Um, the first model doesn't control any control. Uh, the second uh, uh, includes the controls. And the third is adding the labor force status and income. Um, and we see actually that the, the effect is remarkable, 0.3, uh, uh, 0.2 approximately. And this pretty much is un, uh, remains unchanged when we add further controls, including income and labor force status. So the, the effect is still significant and uh, remarkable. Why is it uh, remarkable? Because actually, if you compare that with unemployment, which is a 0.5 approximately, this is an established uh, cost in terms of life satisfaction, one of the major determinants um, in the literature. And together, the two indicators make things as bad as unemployment, but in, if it happens simultaneously, even in addition to that. So based on the relative comparison with the unemployment coefficients, one can conclude 
that this is substantial distress associated with, in terms of life satisfaction, associated with deprivation in these two indicators. Um, so, um, there are many aspects to discuss and the paper covers them all. I want to focus here on a few. Um, in terms of the validity of the indicators, I would like just to mention that um, the empirical evidence we just, uh, we just, uh, uh, I just presented, that can be related back to the considerations that we, whether that makes, whether it's a useful measure or not. For one, um, the overlap analysis or the concordance analysis suggests that we identify different measures, uh, different people. So income poverty and material deprivation are linked, but essentially different concepts also empirically from, uh, from deprivation social participation. Uh, and another aspect is where the evidence relates back to our um, conceptual consideration is, this is sometimes called construct validity. So whether related or other concepts uh, empirically perform as expected. And we see, for example, unemployment and income were performing in the regression analysis as expected uh, with respect to deprivation, social participation, and also the loss in life satisfaction uh, can be subsumed here. What I think is a more important and interesting question to essentially everybody who is working in one way or another on poverty or deprivation measurement is, so how do we, this is a, this is a crucial question, is it preference or deprivation what we observe? Uh, and this has been, there's lots of debate uh, like in the literature going back to, I don't know when, um, but it's, it's notorious. And so what, how does this approach handle this, the, the problems uh, that are connected with it? So whenever we observe a low outcome, it, in principle, we are confronted with the question, is that maybe preference or is that really deprivation? So that's the problem. And the idea how to handle that is actually, well, two or threefold and uh, different elements. Are, we, we can use different elements simultaneously to address that question. So one is to lift the identification actually from the resource space into the functioning space. What does that mean? Well, ideally, when we talk about deprivation, social participation, we talk about the abstract concept. And the idea is at, on that level, preferences do not really matter. So um, people are interested across societies and across time in a minimum level of social participation. There can be, there can be some exceptions, of course, but um, in principle, the idea is preference, preferences matter in particular for the, for the means, for the particular activities. Some people prefer the theater, others prefer the stadium. That's a question of preference if you want, but people want to participate in social life. And this, this kind of reasoning works also well with, for example, being well nourished. Here, if we measure something very close to being malnourished or well nourished, uh, so for example, in caloric uh, intake or malnutrition in, in this direction, then uh, we, we, we are not very much concerned whether that is really a preference. We talk about a preference when, when we talk about particular meals or diets, but when it comes to the functioning measure, it becomes functioning level, it becomes more convincing to talk or um, uh, about deprivation when we observe shortfalls. And related to that is another aspect, namely a particular strict time cutoff. This is point number four on the slides. So we are not talking about a slight decrease in average participation. We are talking about almost no participation at all. And that renders, makes, makes it a problem, as, which is of normative concern for the society and for policymakers. Um, and together, this, uh, this uh, offers a more, uh, con uh, con more convincing approach to measurement. And then this is not, it's not a lacmus test, but it's like, again, lending additional support uh, uh, to the measurement that life satisfaction drops substantially. Uh, so this cannot be really used as an indicator for proper deprivation measurement because there might be adaptive preferences or something along these lines. But if we find that this is again supporting, this is not really chosen uh, it is not really chosen as a preference. It's something people suffer from. Uh, so I will skip the, the cross-country comparison, which is, of course, tricky. We can return that in the debate if you want. And um, uh, on the social indicator, I think this is just one aspect to keep in mind. Uh, in the working papers, again, it's more detailed. Um, but what I would like to... Um, so there, there are several criteria we have to take into account when we construct such social indicators. And they have been discussed and promoted by Atkins and, and co-authors. 
Um, but one aspect is, for example, um, of course, we can always call for better data and we may want to consider diary data or uh, computer assisted uh, collected data um, for more detailed information, who is doing what and how, much, how long and so on. But on the other end, we have to keep in mind, and that's the point uh, in the middle, I'm highlighting this one, I hope you can see it, is the burden to the respondent. Because this measure must be also imp uh, implementable or must be collected in, in large scale service in order to be useful. And I think this is possible with the approach outlined here, um, because it's, it, it relies on 10 questions or so. Uh, but there are other considerations um, relevant for social indicator construction, but I won't discuss them in detail um, here. So then let me quickly conclude. Um, so why, um, wh why should we be measuring deprivation social participation? Well, I would argue first, uh, it's intrinsically relevant and it's also, an, uh, but that's the key reason. It's also instrumentally, uh, instrumentally important and deprivation and, and social participation can unfold in normative force if well constructed and direct attention of policymakers to improve the situation of people who are suffering under such conditions. Uh, I think it's relatively easy to operationalize um, and the presented evidence suggests that such measures can be feasible. Um, and finally, I would like to highlight that if we construct measures in this way, that we, this is point number five, uh, that it, they focus actually on outcome variables, um, that they, which is like a byproduct of applying the capability approach, that they reflect the essence of the normative problem, which is a requirement of the social indicator, and they have the normative force, uh, which also is part of results from the social choice exercise and setting the cutoffs and agree that this is something policymakers should care about, then such features allow us to identify the barriers which prevent people from social participation. And actually the first step is not to identify the barriers, but to demonstrate that they exist. And only then the problem will get sufficient attention. And then we can also direct attention to, to the different barriers that we can identify with such analysis. So then I'm done and thanks for your attention. Um, and I'm now looking forward to any kind of questions, uh, comments, suggestions. But also feel free to, uh, if, if you come later, um, uh, if you later have any questions, feel free to get in touch and send me and drop me a line via email. So any questions or um, let me see the chat, the chat box, where is it? Uh, maybe um, if I if I uh, if maybe I can start uh, with some question. So um, Nikolai, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. I think it was uh, very very interesting. Um, I have noticed that indeed you have uh, skipped a little bit uh, the part of um, cross country comparisons, and uh, indeed I would be in interested to know a little bit more because I know that uh, maybe in some countries like religious activities are uh, a little bit. <laughs> in a way can be considered as a, as a, as a, um, like a means to 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 uh, to socialize and uh, and uh, so it 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 would be interesting also to 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 hear your view about this and i was wondering in also uh, you know in the covid uh, in the covid-19 context if you have started a little bit thinking how how you can develop um, you know this this uh, the topic of of uh, or social participation and social connections uh, due to the restrictions and uh, maybe the new means to to try to uh, uh, participate and and to to have to keep a social social connection. So I was I was really interested to know uh, you know like uh, the, the part on the cross countries uh, differences and also if you are still thinking a little bit how you wanna and if you are thinking of it uh, a follow up and and um, to see how to develop uh, you know in in the COVID nineteen context uh, that we are actually still uh, still uh, living and we don't know. Um, yeah, maybe we will have to 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 stay with it uh, for uh, for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for your uh, for your questions. Um, I, I will respond to them, but uh, we can if there are more, we can come back to uh, to them too. So maybe on the cross country, um, it's true. I mean, I can go back to the slide. I'm not covering this in detail, but 
um, of course, this is challenging and, and I'm not claiming that this is easy, but it seems possible at least. So I didn't do some particular work uh, myself on this. Mm, I mean, cross-country studies need more. I mean, you have to select carefully the data sets the, where you want, uh, to, which you want to use. But the principal idea is um, if we get the measure right in a particular country, I think we have good chances to compare um, similar things. So, I mean, actually, so what I actually don't think is a good way out is number one here. So uh, we could, in that case, we only could compare countries where social activities are very similar. But that's not really a useful way because social activities probably vary already within countries or regions substantially. Urban rural might be, might be a strong contrast depending on the country or even between metropolitan areas. So what could be, so, so the way forward could be if we can really construct um, convincing measures that identify deprivation and social participation in one particular country. So one could make the argument that two people who are living in societies with completely different social activities, but uh, if, if both people are observed not to participate in any of these activities, even though the activities themselves vary in the different, are different in the two societies, one could argue that in the functioning space, they are similar deprived because one, for example, in the case, if, if you, you mentioned religious events, for some reason, some person cannot uh, or must not attend certain uh, or the main, uh, main activities there. Uh, and for, then you compare it with another country where you need money to go uh, to the cinemas and to the pub, but that person has no money and it cannot participate in those activities. In the abstract sense of the functioning space, one could argue these people are comparable in the sense that they fail to achieve social participation, which, is, which happens to be achieved or realized in different societies with different measures. But in the functioning safe space, they are deprived of the very same deprivation. So in this sense, one could argue for a comparability, but I'm not saying that that is easy to implement. In terms of the COVID considerations, um, well, one, uh, one thought here was, um, so, well, put it the other way around. Before COVID, people were saying or asking, what about, um, what about, uh, 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 what about virtual uh, social activities? Uh, and I was thinking maybe it's a useful way to, 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 to see whether uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter and co may kind of qualify to, to have a role there. Now with COVID, I'm less sure that that really works out because most people now experience how uncomfortable it actually can be if you don't have proper social contact. So that is something, I mean, it's like subject to study. I, you cannot just, I cannot just claim it like this, but that, but I think that is something that is now coming increasingly into focus um, that maybe it doesn't work so easy. In terms of follow-up studies, um, in terms of follow-up studies, um, I could imagine different things. Uh, so one is of course, cross-country context would be interesting. One is definitely exploring different mechanisms more carefully. So the role of unemployment, the role of income, the role of uh, uh, health impairments, uh, different things could be easily studied. Um, this is only measurement. And uh, so that, that's definitely one way forward. Another way forward is um, um, to focus on, to improve or to provide additional evidence to, to the validity of the measure. One could do more cross checks in terms of uh, alternative ways to record time and activity just for cross checks. That would be useful. Cross checks for what other commonly, commonly performed social activities would be useful. Um, then one, up, up, one, the role of the workplace would be useful as a common uh, follow-up study. Um, so that is, there are quite a few things uh, one, one could explore. Um, and then let me see, uh, there is also another question in the chat box. Um, The, the, it's true that it, it relates, the, the question in the chat box is, I think you can read it, but uh, how would you address personal preferences? For example, those who, do, who uh, does not uh, engage in social activities, the one uh, that is not intimate, um, simply because they don't prefer. It is true that um, one could argue that 
um, there is a kind of case for some people withdraw on purpose from such activities, in particular when they um, don't like to go to any of the cinema. But still, the argument is that um, then we can still, so one, so one could, one could rely first on additional evidence, for example, in terms of um, mental health considerations, to which extent this can be really supported. Uh, the preference argument is like, it, it can be there in principle, um, but it can also be, there is this problem of adaptive preferences. If you cannot do something, you actually explain yourself that you don't want it. That's another problem with the preferences. But actually what I find more convincing is um, to put this in the context of multidimensional poverty. And then the th the, it might be that, for example, from my own observation or my own experience, I might have to reduce social activities for professional reasons and family reasons. So if, uh, if, if you're also academics, you might have little time for doing anything else. If you have a family, uh, in addition to that, even more so. On the other end, if you put this into the, uh, if you combine this with the, with a view of multidimensional poverty, these people are not at all deprived in any other deprivation. So that's that's something where deprivations would accumulate, and this way, we would start to be concerned, in particular, with people who are deprived in social participation and who may not have a job and who have bad health. So in this stance, in the multidimensional poverty context, we would get accumulating evidence in support of the deprivation. Um, I hope this is addressing the question. Further comments, questions, suggestions? So if you're interested uh, in follow-ups of this work, I will probably um, announce them either via the website of my department, so the Center for Demographic Studies, if something is published or new studies are upcoming, or I usually also use Twitter to inform about updates on, on research projects. So if you're interested in that, uh, you would find information in those places. Further comments, questions? Okay, if that is not the case, then let me thank you for joining the seminar. And hopefully we see again soon, somewhere in some other seminar. Then take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nikolai. Thanks. Thank you.